so welcome everybody back after a break um what i was hoping to do today um usual kind of format start with any pressing burning upsetting questions that you have uh, and then next we will go to um, what I'd like to do is actually run through a slide pack today because I want to talk to you about writing a letter to a client because your next assignment which is due remarkably soon actually um, but your next assignment basically requires you to do that um, sound like a good plan all right if I can see you there seems to be people with their thumbs up that's all I need really. Um, if I can't see you, you need to turn off your microphone or turn on your microphone and yell at me if you want to talk about something else. So let's start with questions, concerns, frustrations. Um, in particular, I have shared some feedback on the, uh, on the assignment itself that you've done and you've all had feedback on that. So if any of you um, have questions about generically um, I'm, I, clearly, this is not the appropriate forum for talking about your specific assignments. Uh, but if you have any, any, any questions there or any questions on the content or where we're going. Oh, the feedback was really helpful, uh, Cathy. Thank you. Um, oh. It was, and it was really good seeing that overall summary you did because it sort of, because sometimes when you do something well, you don't know whether that was a fluke or whether it was sort of, correct and and obviously as well when you made plenty of errors like I did um, seeing that it was a common trend amongst everybody or not or you know uh, it was really helpful. Uh, to be fair everybody while I did try and identify some of the trends and some of the things that stood out um, you know one of the things I love about teaching law is on the whole my students are not idiots like you guys are smart people uh, and so often what you do well and also when you go down the wrong rabbit warren the ways that you get there are interesting anyway um and so everybody will have their own unique way of completely stuffing it up or doing something brilliant or somewhere in between um i've got to say this is a particularly strong group um and it was actually the oua students this time around who you know i think that i had four high distinctions out of the whole group. So there were 35 people who submitted papers at this stage. So there are still, there are, you know, for various reasons, there are always a few others who will be doing a different problem now um, or may not be doing it at all. But uh, so 35 submissions, four HDs, which um, might not sound like a lot, but it's actually way more than I think I've actually seen before proportionally. Like I've had four or five, but in classes of 70, not in 35. Uh, and then two of those HDs came from the OUA class. So I find that really interesting. Um, by the way, this is probably not the forum to say it, but I will nonetheless. Um, I usually feel a little bit sorry for the people who get the HDs the first time around. Um, one of the things that will happen, you know, it, you can rest on your laurels a little bit. Um, and one of the unusual things with a law degree is most students are not used to not getting very high marks. Like on the whole, most law students in their undergraduate degree would have been getting distinctions or high distinctions anyway. So to not get them the first time round can sometimes be a bit of a jolt and, and so people will pay attention to the things that they need to do or change. Uh, and so if you miss out on that the first time around, that can sometimes have uh, repercussions. Um, at this moment, I should probably talk about uh, good mental health in doing a law degree because the jury's out as far as I'm concerned as to whether we uh, make people crazy or we attract crazy, but clearly there's a little bit of both. Um, some of the things that will make you really good at being a lawyer or good at being a law student are things like attention to detail, which could be somebody else's OCD or perfectionism. Um, one of the things that will make you good at being a law student or a lawyer is the, uh, the ability to identify things that could go wrong and think about solutions or mitigating points for them. 
that could be somebody else's catastrophizing. Um, so, you know, just me even saying, yeah, you got an HD, but it's not good enough, or it might not be good enough. That's like, you know, red rag to a bull to some of you. And I'm not actually trying to do that at all. I'm just saying that, yeah, it can be a difficult thing. And one of the things that probably, and I, I really appreciate you saying that Luke before, because one of the things that I personally am trying very hard to do with the feedback is to give you sensible feedback that helps you understand not only where you had the opportunity to improve something, but where actually you did a good job. Because I know my own experience and uh, of going through law school, and to be frank, I didn't get awesome grades through law school. Um, I you know, was pretty in the middle of the road type of student. Um, but one of the reasons I didn't improve is I had no idea what I did well. And to be quite frank, you didn't get a lot of feedback on what you did badly either, particularly in subjects that are 100% exams. Uh, so you would not get that sort of opportunity to grow and to learn from that. One of the things that I'm hoping will happen when we have the um, research masterclass tomorrow night, which I'm hoping most of you will have signed up to join, you will be prepared to watch the recording or you will join us on, live, uh, is that we've got a couple of relatively recent graduates who will be there. And one of the questions I hope I remember to ask them about is about feedback in the profession. I could show you some red markup of um, letters that I have of my own that were marked up in the early days of my career or that I marked up for junior solicitors in the profession. And yeah, there's sometimes there can be so much, there'll be more red, red pen on a page than actual language. And it can be quite disheartening. Uh, and so part of this is about growing your robustness as well. Um, but if you haven't looked at that little video I made with some overview feedback, um, at the time I sent it, I had it as a private link because technically there was still po the possibility that a student or two might submit late with that same uh, problem. Uh, that, that's where we're all past that date now. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's time. Yeah, if you haven't had a look at it, please have a look. If you don't know where it is, please send me an email. So, don't we? Um, 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 let me work out how to do this. I should have it set up in advance. I just want to uh, no go to the beginning. Okay, I am going to share a um, PowerPoint with you and chat to it. Um, I won't be able to see your typed notes and, until after. So if you have questions that you want to put in there for each other, please do that. But I think if you need to stop me, you need to um, basically uh, turn off your microphone and say something out loud. Um, okay, we will go there share hopefully you can see my screen and my powerpoint presentation i don't think i want that i want to be able to see your faces so can you see the first page of the powerpoint presentation no yes somebody anybody it's in the I, presenter mode or something. It's in presenter mode. That's what I was worried about. Okay. Is that better? No. Okay. Sorry. Let me just stop that. Try again. Um, here we go. Hopefully that will be better. That's good. Ace. Okay, so I want to talk about the second assignment. Um, somebody has very kindly today pointed out to me that there is, I need a proofreader. Um, I've made an error in the way that the uh, problem has been presented to you. Uh, and so I will, I'll circulate an alternative for the very last exhibit. So the last exhibit, um, the text messages are back to front. Um, that's my mistake oh. and me working to a deadline without a proofreader. 
Uh, I'm glad so you I, said that, Kathy, because I any was sense. confused and I thought, no, no, just suck it up. It'll be, it'll the thing is, what I'm gonna itself, say, but yeah. The answer, the answer will be different, clearly, if you'll actually, there's a whole new issue that arises uh, if the texts were the right way around. Um, so what I was going to say is, I don't, I don't mind which one you choose. <laughs> Um, it would be handy to me and I might end up sending you an email if it's not clear to me which way you've chosen to do it. Um, I might just tag on a little email from Dennis uh, with an update in relation to that. But if you make an assumption, yeah, either make an assumption that they're the wrong way around or you, um, yeah, we'll swap them around. I don't mind. Um, particularly for any of you who have worked really hard and you are you think you're almost done um, as I have continuously said though I think if you're almost done now um, that's there are things that you're going to miss uh, so the second piece of advice that I am going to give you is that um, the topics that could be covered in this assignment are many and varied uh, pretty much everything up to the end of the contents of a contract uh, could be involved. So anything that we do up to week 10. Uh, and in particular, it would be useful for you to make sure that you've watched the desk lectures for week 10 before you're 100% satisfied that you've identified all of the issues. Unless, of course, you've done all of the reading and my my explanations are of a huge amount of value to you but it's important that you are on top of what all of the alternatives might be um, so hoping that that's a helpful start and we'll talk about those things as we go but what i specifically want to talk about today is um, writing a letter of advice so the Context here is not terribly different from writing a memo. Um, you do need, my advice is always to think before you write. Um, one of the things that I, and I gave people with specific feedback a number of times, and I give it almost every uh, semester, I can't think of a time that I haven't, that, and the feedback will have gone effectively like this if you are affected by it. This looks to me like a fairly good first or second draft. I might have said first draft, I might have said second draft. Um, it looks to me like you started writing without planning and how can I see that? Sometimes you will start off saying that you think the answer is X, but by the time I get to the end, it's pretty clear that you think the answer is Y. You are solving the problem while you're writing about it. Um, and it's, well, if you're me, it's very hard for you to just let go of the work you've already done because you feel like every word that you've written is a word that you'll never get to write again. Uh, it could also be, and again, I suffer from this a little bit, um, particularly when you've got a long piece of work and you're doing it over a period of time, you forget what you've put up earlier and you don't get through and put a proper, uh, put a proper read through. But mainly it is, you know, to quote my Irish father, if I knew I wanted to end up here, I wouldn't have started there. And, and that's part of the problem that you often have is that you've committed so many words to paper and so much of your thinking in the structure while you're writing it that you've kind of written yourself into a corner and you've allowed yourself sort of a certain number of words to deal with a particular element of the problem, but it turns out that that element actually needed more words or less words or perhaps didn't need to be there at all. Think about the iceberg. I want to see what's on top of the water, but in order for that to float above the water, it needs to have the foundations underneath. You need to have done that work. And if you haven't done that work before you start, you're not able to organise the structure of the letter you're not clear on what the purpose of the letter is. So again, we have to suspend disbelief a little bit here for authentic assessment purposes. We are pretending we are writing to this client. So you are going to write to the client. You need to be clear, well, what's the letter for? What, what does the client already know? What do they not know? Where might there be some doubt? 
The other thing to think about, and again, I'm, I'm using a presentation that I do with graduate lawyers in firms regularly here. Um, letters are a really permanent communication. Letters may well get subpoenaed and be put in front of a judge one day. Um, it is really important to make sure that your letter says exactly what it is that it needs to say, nothing more, nothing less. Um, it's, in this particular case, um, you are writing to somebody who is not a lawyer. Uh, so you need to think about how you explain the legal principles to them if you even need to do so. So that brings me to before I go on too far, talking to you about what the objectives of the assignment are. And these come from what the course learning objectives are. And ultimately, each of those four learning objectives that you can see on the screen, one, two, three, and four are covered in this assignment. Ultimately, what you're being asked to do is demonstrate that you understand the legal framework that contract law sits in. Now, again, I'm talking high level here. It could include any of those things, formation, content, or interpretation. Um, it's asking you to critically evaluate policy issues. Now, the extent to which there might be a policy issue in this question um, is somewhat hidden. Um, it's certainly not the crux of the question that you've been asked, but good students might comment to the appropriate audience for that comment on policy issues that come up. You're asked to, and this is really the crux of what you're doing, analyse and research a complex problem and make reasoned and appropriate choices between alternatives. So you've got to analyse the problem, you've got to do the research to support it, you've got to answer the question, and you've, in doing so, you're going to need to make what I call judicious choices. Choices about what's important, what you keep in, what you leave behind. And ultimately, the people who get the good marks in particular will be demonstrating sophisticated, not just basic, not standard, not just competent, but sophisticated, sophisticated cognitive and creative skills. And creative here, I'm not talking about reinventing the way the contract law works or coming up with some argument that you would expect the dudes on suits to come up with. Um, I'm asking you to demonstrate your ability to clearly uh, pull together different concepts to synthesise and create one whole, um, because that's the kind of appropriate response that your client will be looking for. Another comment that I made in a number of cases, um, in exams, Iraq is awesome. I love IRAC. It's such a great way to tick off that you have solved each of the elements of a problem. And in the exam, structuring your answer using IRAC makes it really easy for the people who are marking your exam to find the things that they're looking for so they can tick them off and give you as good a mark as they can possibly give you. Um, it's a really great structure for making sure that you've identified the issue and each of the rules that attach to the issue, that you've applied those ro uh, rules of law to the actual issue and the facts that you have, that you've opened your mind to what the assumptions might be, and then ultimately you've come to a conclusion. But it is, and I'm going to use a technical expression here, a shit way to structure a letter or a memo. It is of very, very limited use, um, and it's particularly of limited use when you're audience is not a lawyer. So many of the issues that we battle with in these kind of uh, problems are not things that a lay person would have even recognised as being an issue in the first place. Um, so let me give you an example. Um, the rule in Pinnell's case. Um, by the way, when I use an example here, I'm not saying that it is or it is not relevant. But the rule in Pinnell's case, does anybody remember what it is? Part payment of the debt on the date, on the deadline is not sufficient consideration? Uh, the debt? Payment of a reduced amount hmm. is not 
sufficient consideration for an existing obligation to pay that amount, uh, or sorry, for the waiver of a promise to reduce the amount, I should say. So if I owe you $100 you, and I say, I can't pay it, I'm not gonna pay it, sue me, you say, you pay me $80 instead. If I pay that um, and no, no other change is made, then you could still sue me for the remaining, tw remaining 20 and I would fail in any claim that you had made a binding promise to me to reduce the debt by that 20. I can't believe that is happening. Sorry about that. It's been beeping away and I've been thinking airline mode, but there you go. Um, so there would be no consideration for that promise. So the issues that arise in relation to Pinnell's case are not obvious to ordinary uh, people. Sorry, that's a terrible expression to use in ordinary people, like lawyers are some kind of extraordinary people. Um, that's not what I mean, although, you know, basically, of course, we're lawyers, we all think we're awesome. Um, so do you understand that there's, if an issue arises because of the way the law operates, um, invitation to treat is not an offer. That's something that most lay people wouldn't realise that there was even an issue to consider as to whether the way goods had been presented was an offer of those goods or an invitation to treat. Particularly that it's more likely than not that when goods are presented by in a store or in a shop window, that they are not being offered for sale. It's just an invitation to treat. So again, thinking about the issue. So if we're structuring and I'm saying, dear Mr. Bloggs, the first issue we need to consider is whether or not this is an invitation to treat, good means nothing. Dear Mr. Bloggs, first issue we need to consider is whether the rule in Pinnell's case applies. So what? So again, think about your audience and think about the way that you structure to meet those requirements. So, um, these slides I'll, be, I'll make available to you, but again, pretty similar sort of ideas for writing the memo. And I'll come back to the memo in a minute, but basically the thinking process requires you to do all of these things. Digest and organise the facts. Work out what's a relevant or a material fact and what's me just wishing I was a creative writing teacher instead. Um, what things are relevant? Why are they relevant? How are they relevant? What more information do you need? Can you organise the flat, uh, uh, facts? What kind of categories would you use? Firstly, timeline is a really useful way of getting started, but is there more than one legal issue here? What order did things happen in? Do we categorise things as being uh, relating to the contract itself, relating to the business relationship, does it relate to something else? What, which of the facts relate to which issues? Uh, legal framework. Now, I've, to I've told you before, I don't want to pretend otherwise, but ultimately every single question you get asked in my class is going to come down to, is there a contract or not? Well, maybe not every single one, but most of them. It's going to be pretty clear if they don't. Is there a contract? Is there something you can sue on? You will learn in advance contract what uh, what it means if there uh, there is a contract, if what it means uh, if we need to calculate damages or assessment or otherwise. But here we've got to ask ourselves, well, firstly, is there a contract? So in order to do that, we need to work through what the terms are, uh, sorry, what the elements of the contract are. But if there is a contract, we need to understand what the terms are. And the terms themselves, as we keep coming back to interlace with the DNA of the deal. So the offer itself, if we can just identify an offer that matches with an acceptance, we have the DNA of our deal because an agreement is made at the point in time and at the place where the person accepting an offer uh, creates the deal. The act of acceptance is just the knowledge that when you've made acceptance and that acceptance has been communicated, that both parties will have obligations and that both parties will have rights. You also need to think about strengths and weaknesses. Um, you do need to think about evidential issues. Now, 
in you clearly don't need to delve into evidential issues in the way that you might if you were for example writing a problem in evidence um, but there are certain issues relating to evidence that we need to keep coming back to so in our last class before the semester break we were beginning a discussion about the parole evidence rule uh, and so that we know that things that are in writing have have greater weight than things that are not in writing and then when we delve into that in more detail you'll start to understand that in fact there are only limited circumstances in which a court will even hear evidence of what happened outside of the written agreement um, if there is an agreement in writing so thinking about whether there is something in writing or not it's going to be really important um, Think about how the situation can be improved. You're specifically asked not to write an agreement, but to provide some advice to the client how to avoid this kind of confusion in the future and to make a kind of checklist for what this agreement or ongoing agreements might look like. Really important, and really I should have this one in flashing lights or a separate color or something. What is the client actually asking you? Can you answer their question? are they asking the right question do you need to advise them about something else how do you do that given the instructions that you have what's the client really looking for and what solutions do you have available thinking about all these things before you even put pen to paper will result in a stronger piece of writing so in a real world, in this document, you will have, or for in this assignment, I should say, you're going to end up submitting two documents. I'm specifically asking you to submit them as one PDF document. So one document that I can run through and put comments all in in one go. And then if you are lucky or unlucky enough that I'm doing them when I'm offline, which often happens when I have so many to mark at the same time, some of you will get scribbled handwritten notes over your um, your PDF, uh, which um, hopefully for those of you who've already experienced that, I've got quite neat handwriting, but do let me know if you can't read it. Um, in the real world, it's probably, you're less likely to write a memo. You're more likely to prepare your draft letter and then take it into the partner's office and they will read it and go through it and you will be asked to explain what you did, why you did it, why it's, is it in that order, why have you focused on this issue and not that issue. Um, for this assignment, the client has specifically asked for a checklist as well. Um, you, actually, if they use that word this time around or looked for, it's not actually the client, it's actually Dennis has asked you for, the, for a list this time around. So what I'm looking for here is something that demonstrates that you can see a way forward uh, for creating a different written document to support this contract or to create this contract, depending on how you find that it lands. Um, I specifically want you to have a look at some contracts in order to do that, but I'm not looking for you to write a contract. Um, there are two examples, quite old examples now, where this specific question was asked in relation to a different matter. Uh, that matter was sort of loosely based on the story from the Merchant of Venice, uh, but basically needed to look at a loan contract there. Um, you'll see that those checklists uh, basically create, you know, lists of, and everybody does them differently. There are lots of different ways to do them. Um, but Basically what I'm looking for is the kinds of headings or little descriptions of what clauses in your agreement might do. Um, and then I want enough information for Dennis to understand why you're going to recommend including that. I am not looking for cut and paste from the Encyclopedia of Forms and Precedents franchise agreement or boilerplate agreement or whatever kind of agreement you think is gonna be most useful sale and purchase of business could be anything really. I really am not looking for that. I'm much more interested in what you think than what you can cut and paste. So memo really, really quickly. You've done one before, you've had some feedback on it. 
Remember what the purpose of this is. This is to support the letter that you want your boss to sign. One of the things that often it's hard for people to think about is, well, what order should I present that? Um, it will depend on how you put that information together. On the whole though, I think usually what works is you're giving the whole thing to a lawyer to sign. So write to a lawyer and explain to them what you think the key issues are and how to address them and then attach the letter for signature that you've already explained. Um, often, again, so people are going to ask me, how many words should I put towards the letter? How many should I put towards the um, memo? I don't know what's going to be best. Um, you've got a total allocation of words, you decide. Mostly though, I suspect that the letter is likely to be shorter um, because part of the art or the craft of being a good lawyer is taking these complex ideas and explaining them succinctly to your client. I think it was Bernard Shaw who said something along the lines of, I'm sorry I wrote such a long letter, I didn't have the time to write a short one. Uh, and we will, I often see in this that we get these great big long letters and there's a memo attached and there isn't anything more. However, some people are pretty ingenious. I've seen some people do things like present the letter um, and then on one side and then have a memorandum that just explains each of the paragraphs and why they've got them in there. That can work, it can fall flat terribly. Again, it just depends on how well you do it and what works best with your style uh, and the way that you've approached the problem. Oh, I started answering some of these questions. Oh, by the way, um, some people are going to think I'm a real hard ass here and I, I wish that I could say it's consistent across the whole of the university or even the school, but it's not. Um, I don't care if you're one minute late, I will deduct 10% of the available marks for being late. Um, whether it's one minute or 23 hours and 59 minutes, you're going to lose those 10 marks. Why am I so hard asked about that when really I'm a pussycat about pretty much everything else? Uh, it's actually because I care about you and I happen to know for a fact that you will not make it 11% better after midnight. The time between midnight and three in the morning, you will not make it 11% better. And that's actually what you need to do. It's a GST on marks, basically. If you were going to get 90 and you submit at that point, you get 90. If you submit at three in the morning, you will get 80 instead, based if, if no change is made. There is absolutely no way that you can get it up to 100. And even and then get your your 90 that you just will not make those extra marks similarly if you are at 55 you will not get it up to 65 at that hour of the night so if it's absolutely not going to pass and you can't do it and you're prepared to wear the as I call it the GST on marks wear it but just go to sleep and do a better job because if you're going to get have any chance of making up the that 11 percent of marks um, you're going to do it better rested than you are in the one minute or otherwise. Um, shit goes wrong, okay? It's happened. It doesn't happen actually very often, but it does happen. If suddenly the internet conks out or you are trying to submit and it doesn't work or something happens, like take screenshots with you, please, um, so we can sort it out the next day. Um, but take the screenshots, go to bed. Like if it's not uploading or if something's working really slowly, um, you are going to be submitting a PDF. The PDF will have a creation date and will not be modified after the due date because if it's modified, I will deduct marks. Um, we can get that sorted, but I do need evidence that there was an issue with the upload. Sometimes it happens. Um, I think for might have been, oh God, the days and the subjects all blur. It might have even been for the OUA students this most recent round, Turnitin was down. 
uh, for the first few days and I gave a blanket extension for everybody for 24 hours once um, Turnitin came back up again. You know, I'm not unreasonable about these things. Stuff goes wrong occasionally, but I am really hard asked on the getting it in on time because you won't make it better. And, you know, on time is almost late. So let's get onto the letter itself. Start here, not a pretty sensible list to start with. Um, what does your client actually want to know? What have they asked you? So again, if you're leading, if you think this is a case about, a problem about Pinnell's case, that might be so, but your client has certainly not used the words Pinnell's case in their letter, or in their uh, request for some advice. Um, you need to think about what they really want to know. So those of you who've been doing the little discussion board um, tasks, um, particularly early on, I gave a few people the uh, piece of advice that actually open with what the issue is, even if it's really obvious. So sometimes the issue is, do you have an enforceable contract? It's very easy for us to drop. So do you have an enforceable contract with X? about why. We tend to drop and sort of go straight to the nub of the issue. Remember that the client needs to go high level and then scaffold in. Um, think about what kind of case your client has or transaction. What, what's their position? Do they, also what do they want? Do they want there to be a contract? If they do, what kind of contract do they want? What they, do they expect the terms to be? Do they want their, to get out of the contract? Um, understanding what they want is different from going hell for leather and just arguing for what they want. Um, but knowing what it is and knowing how to uh, communicate that is really important. So think about what could, they could do to improve their position. Think about what they need to do next. Um, ideally, every letter, email, even text message to a client should have a next action. Do they do something next? Do you do something next? Do you need to answers to their questions? Are you recommending a course of action? What happens next? Um, it's important to remember that you've been asked to give advice. So sitting on the fence is not an option. You've got to lay out what the pros and cons are, but ultimately you need to come down on one side of the fence or the other. I use this slide the first time around. An opinion like Gaul is divided into three parts, sometimes with a fourth on the end. Set out the facts, set out the questions, the ones that have been asked and the ones that you think need to be asked. Provide reasoned answers to the questions and then have a summary or statement of conclusions. The parts don't necessarily fall in this order, but you need to be able to identify each of them, I think. Requests for advice, I won't hang here too often, but um, requests for advice rarely come in the form that you've seen them in this exam scenario. Um, ex oh, not exam scenario, it's not an exam, is it? <laughs> That'd be mean. Um, in, in this uh, problem scenario, um, you would get a proper file. You would get scraps of notes and handwritten bits and pieces, and you would most likely get on the phone and speak to the client, or you would sit in a meeting with the client. Um, in the PHAD and TORTS, you kind of get to simulate that a little bit more, but we don't have the resources to do that, and so we don't actually get that experience. Um, the first challenge in these kind of uh, getting of instructions is identifying questions that the client wants answers to, but also having a conversation with the client to ensure that they understand enough about what the position is. In the real world, best practice is often to, with complex advice is to provide a draft advice in advance, particularly when you are dealing with other lawyers. Um, because it's your advice, you can't just keep changing your advice, right? Um, but particularly when you're basing your advice around some assumptions, um, you may, or your recollection of the facts, or there might be some gap in the information that you have, by setting out in your letter what the facts are, um, you get at, together with the advice, the client gets the opportunity to identify what 
you know, where you're going and to question and more information might come out, uh, which it ultimately changes your advice. We're not going to get two cracks at this one. You know, you're giving your boss a draft letter for signature. And your goal here is to explain that letter and present that draft in such a way where Dennis, aka me, would be prepared to sign that letter without any changes and send it out. So some general rules. First sentence of an advice often acknowledges the request, stating who in the client's office sent the advice, who received it, the firm. So you know, thank you for your letter of the blah, blah, blah to Dennis. He's asked me to prepare a reply to you, blah, whatever. Second sentence tells the client how the advice is structured, representing the questions with short answers. So often actually at the beginning, you will end up with your executive summary. You'll have question one, short answer, question two, short answer, all in your own words, of course. And then you're gonna follow up with more detailed reasons for answers. Again, this is a very traditional and general approach. Use it if it's helpful to you, if you don't need to. There will be some people who will just be able to formulate something along the lines of, dear client, no, love us, something along those lines. Um, so the reasons for answers, in other words, use sign posting. So it's a great, um, and a number of people who did very well in the most recent memo assignment, one of the things they did very well is right at the beginning, they told me what answer I was looking for, um, but then they signposted out where the different issues would be. So in section A, I deal with blah, blah, blah. In section B, I deal with blah, blah, blah. The reason that you do have a contract is set out in blah. The reason you don't have a contract is there's no consideration. For more information about that, check X. By the way, I'm just putting words in there. Today, I don't even remember what the question is. So any, I'm, I'm not gonna inadvertently give you any clues because I ran a half marathon this morning. I'm exhausted. Um, think about your audience. I've mentioned this a number of times. Um, you don't need to set out the basic principles of law. So think about it yourself. Try now and put yourself into the position you were in six weeks ago. Imagine what kind of letter would be useful to you six weeks ago before you knew nothing about the law, before you knew anything about the law, I should say. Um, you would not be interested in a page and a half about consideration. What you want to know is, is your contract binding and what you can do to fix it. You need to ask yourself what the reader might reasonably have assumed, be reasonably assumed to be familiar with. So can you assume that they understand that there's a franchising law, for example? And by the way, I don't, I don't want you to go deep into what franchising law is um, in relation to this problem. I want you to stick with the contract problem. But what things can you assume? Can you assume that they know, for example, that if there is a contract, they might be able to sue or be sued under it? If there is a contract, then the contract will have terms that stipulate what is or is not allowed. Okay, so rules about writing. Um, if you have to refer to cases or legislation, Think about the way you are going to do that. Firstly, your client is not a lawyer. So do you need to use cases at all? Sometimes you might. It might be edifying to say, um, the reason that there is no contract is that no offer was made. Uh, this might be confusing to you. An offer has been long understood to be blah, blah, blah. Um, 150 years ago, there was a very famous case called Carl Hill and Carbolic Smoke Ball, where it was found that this was a true offer and not a puff, blah, 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 blah. So you might actually refer to cases. Now, this can get tricky because you still need to use AGLC4. 
think about it as a client of a law firm would you be expecting to read things that had footnotes in them i would suggest possibly not very often but maybe um, think about whether or not how you present your citations um, if you need to include citations at all in the letter now when you are giving it to your boss your boss is going to want to know that every statement you make about what the law is can be supported by a citation. So you might need to think about how you deal with that. Let me tell you about some of the ways I've seen it dealt with successfully in the past. One of the things that I've seen people do is give a draft letter to Dennis that is riddled with footnotes with a little note in the memo that says, I've included footnotes throughout the letter to, um, incorporate all of the citations so that you know what case law supports the statements I've made. But I suggest that we delete those before we send it to the client. As long as it's written in a way that supports that, that's a brilliant way of doing it. Some people have put the letter on one side of the page and sort of put a table on the other side, referring across to the stuff that's less relevant. So many different ways of doing it. Uh, some people use a little comments box. Some people have used EndNotes. Um, some people have just put boxes between the paragraphs uh, that would be deleted afterwards. Again, different levels of success or otherwise, but think about it. Think about what the end product needs to be. Think about what your objective here is, which is to get your boss to sign that letter and send it out with the minimum amount of interference. So removing footnotes is one thing, rewriting the whole thing is another. Ah, oh, what else here? Ah, numbering paragraphs. I love a numbered paragraph personally, um, particularly if the letter is more than a couple of pages long. Uh, it does mean that you can move backwards and forwards through the letter and understand where things are. It's a great way of signposting. Uh, think about your reader though. Um, one of the things I saw a number of times uh, in the most recent uh, assignment so there would be a section, a couple of people did this, where there was a section in the memos that set out what the facts were, but instead of putting them all up front or all the things that they thought were relevant, they'd have them in an appendix and then they might just be numbered, you know, fact one, fact two, fact three, which actually meant when you were reading the memo, you kept having to slide down to the end and have a look at it. So what Dennis would have done, because I assume he's a Luddite, he would have printed it out if his printer was working and you'd have to have the memo on one side and just keep cross referring over. It's like the idea, I mean, how to be successful in life is make your boss's job easier today than it was yesterday. Uh, and so the more work that we're doing, matching things across, the more difficult it is, the crankier we are, the less likely we are to promote you. Um, Remember too, and I know it's not really about me, but I'm marking online. So I'm having to scroll right down, scroll right back up again, scroll right down, scroll right back, and to check where we're up to. Um, again, this is one of the reasons why footnotes absolutely beat endnotes for your citations. And footnotes are actually the AGLC way of doing it anyway. It's one of the only things I like about it. Um, what else do I want to say here? By the way, if it's in the letter, think about. Um, Think about the tense that you use and um, the pronouns that you use. Is this a letter that's going to be signed by Dennis? If it's going to be signed by Dennis, will it be have his signature at the end and will it use I, 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 I? Or will it, as a boss of mine used to say, piss all over the page, we, 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 we? Uh, traditional law firms often use we because it's the advice of the partnership and all of the partners are equally liable for the advice. So in our opinion, we suggest blah, blah, blah. Um, so think about the pronoun that you use. Um, be consistent, um, but ideally make a sensible choice. Um, it might be that you're signing, you and Dennis are both signing a letter, in which case it would be a we. Think, make sure it's a sensible uh, choice. Um, basically, 
it's going to be assumed that's your opinion if it's not supported by a citation. Um, think about the language that you use to modify. Um, my little process diagram for working out whether or not you need to incorporate, uh, incorporate a reference or a citation. Um, are you quoting directly from somebody else's work? If you are, acknowledge that it's a direct quote in a footnote. If it is more than three lines, in fact, actually, I think AGLC4 has changed this to four lines. Um, somebody, you might like to check AGLC3 before, before you put this out. Um, think about the rules that you have there, the smaller text. Think about quotation marks. One of the reasons why many of you find Turnitin gives you much higher uh, Turnitin scores than you're expecting is because Turnitin looks for quotations using double quotation marks like the rest of the world and AGLC3 uses single quotation marks or possibly no quotation mark at all depending on how it's formed. So often if you're doing a good job and using AGLC4 properly, you will end up with a higher Turnitin score. So there's an art to reading a turn it in. Uh, what else here? Think about when you're paraphrasing the work of others, when you summarise somebody else's ideas, um, or if you use the ideas in other ways. Um, ultimately, if you've got no citations or no need to cite, then think about whether or not you've done enough research too. Uh, so again, many others will do it. They'll say that I would be expecting about five cases for every thousand words, or I have no idea what the formulas are, I just made that up. Um, I don't work that way. I work on, have you picked the right cases? Have you um, supported each statement of law with the case? Um, and have you made sure that you've really given thought to the breadth of the available cases? Again, everybody's been very quiet. I hope that's because I'm incredibly interesting. Um, but if I'm not, you just really need to shout out with some questions or, you know, throw virtual tomatoes at me or something. Audience is really important. And this is the, this is the crux of this. Now, the two example papers, I really like both of them because they're so different from each other and they're both very strong papers. Neither of them are perfect. I think they're both HD papers, but they're both in the low 80s. But I like the way that they're so different from each other and that because they should be able to give you a sense that actually being original and having your own voice is important. But the thing that they both do really well is that they assume that each piece of writing, the letter and the memo, have a different audience and they're written with a different audience in mind. Write the type of letter that you'd like to receive if you were the client before you started studying law. Your client is not an idiot. They do not need to be patronised. They do not need to have things over explained to them. Uh, no, is there a lawyer splaining version of mansplaining? I'm sure there is. Um, they need to be treated as intelligent people and have their question answered. But the amount of detail and depth that they need and the focus that they need is quite different from what writing to another lawyer will mean need. Um, avoid your use of Latin phrases unless they're absolutely necessary. Uh, use short, active, direct language. Um, oh, where have I put it? I took it out and I've put it away. Uh, there is a book. It's gone. I put it away. I took it out for this class and ah, here it is. I knew it would be on my desk somewhere. This available online in the library. Uh, it is called Effective Legal Writing, a Practical Guide. Nicola Corbett Jarvis, Brendan Griggs. Absolutely excellent examples of a range of different forms of legal writing. Um, and also lots of alternative words to the Latin. Um, using the Latin feels like showing off, feels like you're being clever, but actually translating particularly to the client in ways that they can succinctly and clearly understand the key messages 
demonstrates far superior intellect. I've actually already spoken about citation, so I just want to finish here with the last point there. Um, academic integrity is the other overlay issue here. So in your letter, where I think there are a lot of good reasons why you would be avoiding lots of citations, uh, you still need to support every statement of fact, including a fact about what the law is, with a citation. So it's the same as writing in any other course. If you're drawing from anybody else's work, if you are making a statement of some kind of what the law is, you need to be able to point to the data. Ah, this statement. Um, I assume you were, have understood already that I am, um, I am very senior in the Paduta industry, eh, eh, the Paduta Institute. Um, so the pulled it directly out of thin air. Um, sometimes it's the Paduma, so pulled it directly out of my, you can decide. Um, Ultimately, academic integrity requires you to avoid the institute. Academic in, uh, integrity requires you to support every statement that you have with not just the vibe, this is the case, way the cases work. You need to be able to point to a case to support every statement that you make. Now, sometimes we quite clearly and carefully make sure that you've got the opportunity to go and search for those rather than just putting them in a slide to make it too easy for you. But there are so many different resources. Many of you are already using what I call my cheat sheet, um, sort of my big mind map of cases that have been put together to support each of the uh, topics that we have. You'll find it in the, if you have it already, in the revision area of the, um, so for topic 12 or week 12, our revision area and exam prep, um, that might be a good starting point for you, but probably a better starting point will be your textbook uh, and the case book, but also your own research. The students who do really well will do their own research and they will find new undiscussed in class cases. Okay, letter. The final paragraph of your letter should contain your conclusion. It should address each of the questions that are asked. If there's more than one reason for your conclusion, you need to state it. In the short answer, you just need the key one. In the real world, your conclusion should also state as to whether anyone else in the firm has read or confirmed the advice if it's been signed up. Again, that will depend very much on the practice of the firm that you work with. Think about whether your conclusions are useful. Litigation isn't always the only solution. You've got to think about who your client is, what their resources are, and what it is that they are really trying to achieve. And if you've got that information in your planning and you've thought about it, that will make your uh, conclusion much more creative, much more useful. Some things about letters in particular. Use short sentences and paragraphs. Every sentence should have a topic. topic. So every paragraph should have a topic sentence. Every sentence should have a verb. Every paragraph should be contained where possible to one idea. Think about using headings. Think about the language that we use. Be as simple and straightforward as you can. So if something needs to be signed, just say sign, not affix your signature. Um, in the event of is very rarely necessary, just use if. Allow rather than afford an opportunity. There's a list here. Some of the ones I absolutely hate. I just thought I'd throw in the ones that really annoy me. Aforesaid, albeit, before mentioned. Uh, just said generally, actually, unless you're saying that somebody said something. Here in 2-4, here and after, it is regretted. I'm sure I can make a longer list, but they're some of the ones that often people put in or utilise is another one as well, particularly when it's got a Z in it. Uh, and whilst. Ooh. 
In the real world, the purpose of letters includes helping clients manage business risk. You manage that with good writing. Good writing minimizes confusion and uncertainty. It reduces the risk of misinterpretation. It reduces the risk of complaints and ultimately reduces the risk of claims against the firm. There are professional responsibility reasons for getting the writing right. So in the interest of active advice, you need to think about things like being accurate. So in the real world, you would be checking facts. If you're unsure about the facts, and in this context, if you're making assumptions, then emphasize that you're providing the advice based on the facts that you've included, list them. This means your client can contact you with additional information. Simplicity is the goal, but don't take it to such an extent that the letter becomes inaccurate or misleading. Remember that you are advising, you want to fall on one side of the fence for sure, but you will need to address the pros and cons. Try not to show emotion. Um, clients need to feel that you're on their side and that they're taking, you're taking their best interest to heart, but that means that you need to avoid uh, either being overly emotionally on their side or particularly being angry, rude, or emotional in communications with third parties. Little things can make the difference here. Um, one of the things I pick up quite often is you've got first names and surnames in the problem. Often people, particularly because in exam problems in law school, you often just got one name and everybody just uses that one name. But if you're using the first name of a party who your client might be having a dispute with, it can suggest an, uh, that you're overly familiar with the other side in a way that can be actually uncomfortable for your client. Again, all this sort of thing is just thinking about who your audience is. Think about the way you address people. Um, in a choice between uh, formality and otherwise, you be slightly more formal rather than less, but at the same time, simple and direct. Modern plain language is simple and direct. That doesn't remove the politeness, you're not just being polite for the sake of politeness. Um, big piece of advice, check everything before you send it. In the real world, this means if you dictate a letter, somebody else types, um, read it before you send it, always. There is never, ever, ever, and I speak from painful experience here, it's never, ever, ever a good idea to let a letter go out without it actually being looked at. In this context, with you writing an assignment for me, genuinely, I know that the ones that will be the best, they will have finished at least 48 hours before, maybe more than that, and they will have read it out loud at some point. They will put some thinking music time between finishing it and then reading it, or having it read to them, um, and they will benefit from that reading and thinking time. Um, I know I've made this suggestion before, but one of the things I see work really well is get your phone or your computer to read your document out loud to you. Turn it, most PDF readers have a speech to te or text to speech function. The robot voice, it sounds terrible, but the robot reads exactly what you have written, the way it's been punctuated, and you will hear where it doesn't make sense in a way that you won't see it. So in summary, any legal opinion should be written with the reader in mind. It needs to be clear, well-reasoned and concise, but it needs to be clear and concise without sacrificing completeness needs to be set out in a logical way, a logical structure that's based on the legal principles that are being discussed. Any piece of legal writing should be read before submission to ensure against grammatical or typographical errors, which will detract from the communicative value of the work. Above all, the advisory purpose of a legal opinion should be borne in mind at all times. You are not a judge. You are not making any declaration you are providing an opinion and giving advice. 
In relation to this, this is clearly not your assignment, but make sure that you look at the assessment criteria. You can find them by looking in the rubric area. Uh, there is a rubric that you can print. Uh, you can also download the rubric. You will see it's not terribly different from the one that you would just mark by. Um, the differences only relate to the fact that there are two different pieces of paper uh, or two different documents with different audiences and there's a couple of references to the checklist in there. So have a look at them but now you've seen how I use that criteria you can think about what you can do to jump up from the level that you are already in or to maintain your superior status and maybe even get into the 90s. Answer the question really important to answer the question even if you don't get the answer right if you don't answer the question i have an issue if you get the answer right but it's hidden there somewhere and i can't see it it's problematic make sure you include everything that you've been asked to include check the instructions i've asked for everything in one pdf document if you are unclear send me a message ask me in class send me an email Think about the order that you present things in. You're providing a package so your boss can sign off. Think about what your audience needs. Give yourself some thinking music time to proof and to take a high level view. Again, did you answer the question? Get it in on time. List of resources that I've used in relation to putting that together. I think it's only fair that I give you some references from time to time, seeing I'm asking you for them. Questions, concerns, frustrations? I just want to say- Oh, stop. we're running late, sorry. But I'm back. Kathy? Yeah? Can we just circle back to the question. Um, before you had stated that the um, the checklist was to be given to the dentist, but in the assignment. In the, sorry, I'm. I have just had a moment brain fart, but I oh, had somebody there that probably shouldn't hear the word fart. Sorry about that, Luke. Um, and I was thinking, oh, actually, I might have changed the question this time around. Let me bring up the question so we can have a look at it. Sorry, oh, I'm so tired. I can't even see today. Um. So what does, what have I said, uh, Emily? I can't remember. Uh, if crazy cons were to put together a standard set of terms and the conditions of sale, um, what terms would be included in the agreement? Um, so that's for in, uh, uh, but I haven't put that as part of the question that Con asked, did I? I've just put no. it. Did you? Oh, I did, it's Con's question. Con's question, yeah. Oh, okay. 11.4. Good to know. So does that mean that it would be uh, in simple language and then you would... Yeah, you will need to think about that. And I, uh, this is probably why I was thinking about because it, it's often one of the hardest things to do. Um, so again, what's often happened is it's... So that would be... is often an attachment to the letter or part of the letter, depending on how you want to do it. Um, and the hardest thing there is often explaining in non legalistic terms why you would include the particular thing that you're advising on uh, and then maybe supporting that with some cases or something else and thinking well how do i make this work often people will say okay let's put the i'll put the table together or the checklist together in some way um, and then have some sort of way to let dennis know what the background is whether that's footnotes maybe having an extra column that gets deleted, okay. uh, maybe just explaining it in a way that is so abundantly clear and incorporates cases and other references in a way that your client would be comfortable with. It's really up to you how you do it. Mm -hmm. um, I can throw in, I might throw in some other examples actually just to get a, a broader term. But the thing is, do I, if I give you too many examples, I limit your creativity. And then, then it makes it harder to, for people to get really good marks when they've come up with something absolutely brilliant, but I know that they've seen something similar or... 
do I overthink this? I know you guys overthink it, but like maybe I overthink it too. <laughs> Could be how we work. Uh, sorry about that. I really am having, I, I wrote that problem um, the day it went out to you, which was the day it was due um, after, you know, criticising others perhaps for leaving things to the last minute. Um, but there are a few reasons why it was a bit crazy around that time. Uh, and so I actually have very little memory of the problem other than it's got quest characters from... Did anybody recognise the source of the characters? So, yeah, Killing Eve. And for what it's worth, I haven't started series two yet. So um, I'm just, I haven't had time for that. So that shows how busy I am. Um, yeah, but don't worry, I won't just mark it based on my vague memory that you have a question. I will have the question in front of me at the time. Um, you know, I, I promise. Does that answer your question, Emily? Yes, thank you. Other questions, concerns, frustrations? This is just weird. We have this very like intimate, you know, you're like in my study with me kind of thing going on. You guys ask way more questions in class than you do like in your own homes. Like what is, well, actually, Steph, you're not in your own home. I can see where you are. Um, no, this is my personal library. <laughs> I put it open to Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I prefer fiction myself, but, you know, each their own. Well, we are late. It's now almost quarter to eight, so... At, yeah, God knows how long it would take if I actually let you ask questions. Um, I, I am serious, though. I am happy to take a call or to have um, an email exchange if you have questions. I will share this, um, uh, this PowerPoint with when I circulate the recording of this tute, which will probably be sometime mid-morning tomorrow, depending on how quickly it processes. And, um, yeah. Tomorrow, do not forget that we have a, um, a session that the LSS has organised uh, specifically on research. Uh, it would be a very good one to come to with questions about research for this assignment. Um, but there is a broader audience of law students that will be there. Um, I'm facilitating, we've got somebody from the library, we've got a couple of graduates, one of whom did nothing but research for the first couple of years of their professional lives. Um, and the way I plan to facilitate it is very much focused on, okay, how do you do this in the real world? How do you actually get, find the cases that you need to support the work that you're doing? Where do you start? When is Google your friend? When is it not? How do I know? Those kind of things. Uh, it, we will be live scr uh, streaming it um, unless there's a disaster. I will also record it and share the recording of it. But if you can attend in person um, or attend on the live stream, you will have a much better experience, I think. And come with questions uh, and bring a computer so you can have a go at trying some things. And high five Steph and say thank you to her because she's the one who's organised it all. <sighs> all right, on that charming note, um, I'll remember to look at my camera instead of down and wish you all the best and I'll see many of you in less than 24 hours. Take care. Bye, Kath. See ya. Thank see you. Ya. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.